All right, everyone, we've got about one minute before we get started. Again, if you have time to download these following apps that are listed, you'll have a little bit of time before we need to use them before we get started. Um, but this program will be much more fun for you if you have these apps ready and can use them. So these, the four apps that we're gonna talk about today, the Merlin Bird ID app, iNaturalist, Seek by iNaturalist, and we'll get a little bit into eBird. We've got a couple more people joining on, but we will go ahead and get started. So thank you everyone for logging on today for this hopefully super fun program. We are going to be learning about different technology that you can use to explore your backyard. My name is Julie Watson and I am our wildlife education coordinator with the Nevada Department of Wildlife. And I am joined by Jessica Wolf. She's our urban wildlife coordinator and there's a nice picture of her with one of our, um, one of our resident snakes that we use for education programs. Jessica Wolf is going to be helping us out with monitoring the chat box. And so today, there are a couple ways that you can participate. First, I want to tell you all that you are muted and I can't see you. So you can wear whatever you feel is comfortable during these uh, weird times that we have. I cannot see you or hear you. So there are a couple ways that you're going to be asked to participate today. We have a chat box and you can get to that chat box. It is down probably in the bottom of your screen. That's usually where it will show up. And you can use that chat box to communicate. Now the chat box does uh, default to just sending to the panelists and myself, but we want everyone to be able to see what you're saying. So there's a little drop down arrow at the top and it says two. And you're going to want to change that so that it says to all panelists and attendees so that we can all see what you're saying. Um, now, there's quite a few people on here, so we don't want to overwhelm the chat, chat box. Um, and we will also be using polls, too. So um, with that, we have a couple rules because this is a family program. It's rated PG. We please do not use any profanity or inappropriate behavior in our chat box or with any Q&As that we might have, which we do not have Q&As today. We're just going to have a chat box. Um, we don't want to have to mute you or remove you or any of that. Um, and we want to stay on topic. So there will be certain points during this presentation where you will be encouraged to use the chat box. And please do. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So a lot of you are here because maybe you've come across something in nature and wondered what it was. So we're actually gonna take a poll and I'm gonna go ahead and launch this and you guys can click whatever answer you that applies to you. So if you've ever been out in nature, maybe in your backyard and you're like, whoa, that's super neat. I wonder what it is. All right. So here's the results of that poll. Good job, guys. So everyone's super curious. Everyone's found something before in the wild and been like, I really want to know what that is. Well, luckily, <clears throat> there's an app for that. And there's more than one. There's a lot of apps for that. There's all sorts of apps out there for exploring nature. And I do want to preface this by saying that we are not sponsored by any apps. We do not get any money for any of these apps. These are just my personal opinions of apps that I have worked with and that I really like. So here are a bunch of apps that we can use to explore nature. Um, but we are going to be covering these four right here. So we've got the Merlin Bird ID app, we've got the eBird app, we've got iNaturalist, and we've got Seek by iNaturalist. So we've got a couple different apps. Um, so with that, I want to ask you guys, and you can respond in the chat, has anyone used or heard of some of these apps? And I think I saw some answers already popping up in the chat box that some people have used it. Oh, someone was asking, um, what are apps? Apps is short for application, not appetizer. And 
applications are used to help you do certain things. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have different applications on their phone that you help them use um, text messaging. We have our messaging apps. We have map apps. Those are all applications that help us do things. And it looks like a lot of people haven't used these apps before. Oh, someone hasn't heard of Seek. Oh, cool. Very cool. Oh, yeah. And I'll go back. So someone wanted to see what some of the apps were on here. Um, so a lot of these are similar to what we already use. Onyx, Hunt, and All Trails are actually map apps for when you're outside, which obviously we are not doing right now. We are inside. We're staying at home. Social distancing. Um, Plant Snap, Journey North, Project Noah, Leaf Snap. Um, those are all very similar apps to uh, what we're going to talk about today, but just a little different. These are just the ones that I have the most experience with and the ones that I like the best. Going to take a look at that chat again. Someone's still using books. That's actually a really good point. Um, these apps do function as a replacement to, um, to some field guides. Um, I find that I also really like having a book, but it's nice to be able to just walk outside and just have your phone and have access to all sorts of stuff. So moving on, these apps, I picked these four because all of them have some sort of citizen or community science component. And so I've got another poll for you all. So our, how familiar are you with citizen and community science? So go ahead and click here. Looks like we've had some people that have participated in projects. They've heard of it, but never participated. Some people really just want to learn more. Cool. I'm going to tell you about it. Very cool. We've got, we've got a couple people that, have part, that participate in projects all the time. That's really, really neat. Very cool. Here's the results for that. So citizen and community science is the collection and analysis of data relating to the natural world by members of the general public, typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. So co community or citizen science is really, really just a fun way to, com to contribute to science. And we'll talk a little bit more about how these apps can contribute to that. But basically, it's crowdsourcing data. It's giving people the tools to go out and collect data. And then the scientists get to do all of the fun stuff like analysis and math and graphs and all of that. We get to do the, the fun part of data collection. So before we move on to our apps, I wanted to cover ID basics because our phones are smart. And these apps are smart, but we still need to use some of our own observational skills and our ID basics. So the first step in ID basics is size and shape of whatever it is that you're looking at. How big is it? What's the general shape? So I've got a bird here and in the chat, if you can identify that bird in a beautiful Joshua tree, please let me know what you think that bird is. Owl, and then someone who, which Anne, are you related to Rob Lowry by any chance? We've got owl, 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 and a couple people were able to identify it to the species. Now there's nothing in this photo but a silhouette and some of you are able to identify this bird by species. It is a great horned owl sitting in a Joshua tree. Pretty cool. So that, that is a huge ID basic is size and shape. We'll go ahead and move on. Behavior is a really big ID basic too. So in the chat, let me know. If I told you and I was like, you know, I found this really weird animal it's rooting around in my garbage, eating my garbage. What do you think that animal would be? What's your guess? We've got a couple correct guesses. A raccoon. 
So what is that animal doing? We've had some other good guesses too. We had bear, coyote, raccoon, rat. Those are all animals that you might find in your garbage. They like, they're opportunistic animals. They're gonna go for your garbage. So behavior is a really good one to um, take into consideration too. So using these apps, you can look at whatever animal it is that you're interested in. What was it doing when you saw it? And location. So we live in Nevada. We're not gonna find a penguin in Nevada. So location is really important um, to take into consideration. If I told you I saw a black mamba, that's what that is, you'd probably be like, no, you definitely didn't because they don't live here. Now there are exceptions to everything. Maybe someone's pet got out, um, but that is highly, highly unlikely. And then the last thing is color. Color is probably the first thing that we recognize something or how we wanna describe things because humans are so visual, but color is very relative. It is still important in identifying, but it's so relative. I think we all probably remember some of these social media pictures and how everyone was seeing them in different colors because of their own personal eyesight, the how bright their own computer was. So color is completely relative and animals change color seasonally. So birds are a huge one. They change colors between the seasons, sometimes very drastically. So that's just a little reminder that when identifying, we need to be careful about just honing in on color because color is, is very relative. All right, so let's get into it. So the first app that we're gonna cover is the Merlin Bird ID app. And you can probably tell by the name that it is a bird specific app. This app is um, done by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It is, I highly recommend anything by the Lab of Ornithology. It's super great. And um, if you're home with students or kids, they've got lots and lots of free educational sources. They're all about bird sight is the place to go to learn about birds. And this ID app is really, really easy to use too, and I highly recommend it. Um, and you, you have access to a ton of information at your fingertips. So let's go ahead and get started here. I want you guys, I'm gonna do this with you too. I'm gonna pull this up and what I'm gonna do is I am going to walk through some of the functions of the app and then we're gonna try and test it out. So when you open it up, you can see that you've got um, a menu in the corner here, start bird ID, get photo ID, explore birds. And we're gonna go ahead and go to that side panel. So clicking this three layer button here to get to the menu. And when you do that, all sorts of stuff is gonna pop up. So um, you can also connect this to your eBird, which I'm going to talk about more. But that homepage is where we just were. You can also start bird ID, which is gonna be the first thing we do. So we're gonna move on to start bird ID. And this is if you see the bird and you don't have a picture of it, or maybe you do have a picture of it, but you want to do it this way. There's two ways to ID birds. And actually I'm gonna go back and show you from that start um, panel. So start bird ID or get photo ID. So start bird ID is what pops up in this here when you go to start bird ID. And we're just gonna do that one first because it's first in the menu. And that's where that's starting. So location is the first thing that pops up and you can use your current location. This is just a test, we're not gonna submit anything. And then what day did you see the bird? So you could be like, you know, I saw this in winter. And with birds, it's important to know what day because they migrate. So different birds would be more capable of, or more likely for you to see during different times of year. Um, so I just kept it on today, hit that next button. And then this is really cool. So we were just talking about those ID basics. What was the size of the bird? And if you experiment by clipping, clicking on one of those, you'll see that when you click on one of those dots, it tells you what size 
in relation to other birds it's talking about and it'll say between a robin and a crow or crow sized or between a crow and a goose. And we're not really IDing anything yet. So um, what were the main colors? You can pick up to three and that pretty much covers most of the colors of a bird, I guess. You can tell we don't have a ton of green birds in North America. Was the bird, what was it doing? This is that behavior part. Was it eating? Was it swimming on the ground, soaring or flying? Um, so that helps too. And that's it. Those are the five questions. And once you answer all of those questions, and you can see this is how I answered this when I took this screenshot. I said it was between a robin and a crow size. It was green, brown, and gray, and it was eating at a feeder. And so one of the first animals or one of the first recommended birds that pops up is a morning dove, which makes sense. That's a common bird feeder bird. It's between a robin and a crow. It's green, brown, and gray. And then you can see there's a couple other birds that are suggested too. I did not have a bird in mind when I took these screenshots. I was just clicking through. So, um, so there's two different ways to look here. This is the list view. You can also see the detail view. And so you can see, oh, this is very common. Whereas some other birds that pop up might not be very common. So this is a really common bird found in a variety of habitats, all of that. So that's the basics for the start bird ID. So if you're looking out your window and you see a bird, that's what you do. So what we're gonna do next is we're actually gonna try it out. So we've got two birds here, probably of the same species. They are of the same species. Um, but one is a male and one is a female. And so I want you to go ahead and go through using that bird ID app and I'm going to put a poll out so everyone can put what they think they saw. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to decide. Now, some of you might know what this bird is just by looking at it. All right. So it looks like most of us got it. Good job. It was a house finch. And you can see there's a couple different lists of, of, uh, of birds that kind of look like this. And I um, decided not to put a purple finch in there because I didn't want to confuse anyone. Um, but good job. So go ahead and tell me in the chat how easy that was to do. Easy or hard? All right, everyone's saying easy. Yeah, easy and fun. Great, good, good. So the next part, if you thought that was easy, the next way that you can use this is even easier. So if you click that home button at the top when you're done IDing your bird, it'll take you back to this home screen and you can hit this photo ID. And so we are going to take a photo because this is basically a two or three step process. And I'm gonna show a bird on the screen and you guys are gonna take a picture with your app and we're gonna see if it IDs it. So click that photo ID and click take photo and you'll be ready for this next, this next photo. And I picked a very easily identifiable bird. I'm sure a lot of you know it. Um, already, but that's how we can test that the app kind of knows what we're looking at. And so I'm going to go ahead and test that too. All right, I'm going to give everybody a couple more seconds to get a good photo. I've got a good photo of our magpie so that we can use it to ID. All right, so we're going to use that photo and then you want to adjust it. So you can see in my screenshot, I don't have the full bird in the picture. So you kind of want to manipulate it. You can use your fingers to zoom in and out to make sure that the entire bird is in that box. And then you hit next so that you can confirm that location and date. And then we'll see if it identified it. So mine said black-billed magpie. Did everyone else's let me know in the chat box. Yep, looks like everyone got it. And so you can click on your bird 
click that identify button and click on your bird, this arrow right here, and it'll say, yes, this is my bird. You did it. So if we go back to our home screen and you can confirm that you want to start over, that's totally fine. There's a couple other things on here. So that's that's a lot of the Merlin Bird ID app that you can use if you see something and you don't know what it is. But you can also use this app as a field guidebook too. And so we are going to look at the Explore Birds button at the bottom right here. And we're going to click that. And when I took this screenshot, I was on the U.S. Northeast pack, not the Rocky Mountains pack. And you can change your bird pack so you can download different ones by pressing that button in the upper right that has the lines and the circles on it. And so I have a couple, only a couple bird packs installed because it does take up a lot of space on your phone. Um, but you can toggle through different ones. So I changed mine so that it was actually appropriate to where I am now and click done. And so now there's a lot of the same waterfowl. Um, but this explore birds part is really cool. It's organized very similar to most field guides. It's got the waterfowl first and then the hawks and then the whole back half are the, um, the perching birds. So it's very, very similar to a field guide. So we're not deviating too far from what we're familiar with. And then I'm gonna go ahead and click on this wood duck so you can see what the information looks like. So when you click on that, you can click on whatever one you want, but you can also scroll through pictures. So wood duck, wood ducks are one of those beautiful birds where the males look totally different from a female. So you can scroll through those photos and see the females compared to the males. Down at the bottom, you can also look at the calls. And that's actually one of my favorite things. I know I've been out hiking before and I've heard a weird bird call and um, I really like birding. So you can get to a point where I'm like, I think that's this type of bird, but I don't know what it is. And I'll go in here and I'll play it and while I'm outside so I can compare it. Um, and you can listen to all sorts of calls. And then there's that map portion at the bottom too, where you can see where they live. And this, these are the exact maps that are off of that All About Birds website. That is so, so good. So it's really, really cool to be able to have that all at your fingertips while you're outside or you're in your backyard, you don't have a way to um, get access to an expert, you can do it on your own. So someone is asking in the chat, how do I see male versus female? So in the wood duck here, you can see the picture, that's a male. And if I swipe one way or the other, that's a female. And it says it in the bottom corner which ones they are. And I, my hands are sweaty. So that shows, and some birds have more pictures than others. This wood duck has a lot of pictures, which is cool. Ooh, that one's really cool. So that's the gist of Merlin Bird ID. Um, I do encourage you to ex explore it more. It's really neat. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can do on it, even, even without um, the bird ID, even just exploring some of this stuff, you know, when you're bored. Um, and All About Birds is great too, if you have a, if you have a laptop. Um, so that's the gist of Merlin Bird ID. So I wanted to quickly go over eBird eBird is a huge thing. So um, I'm going to finish eBird and then I'm going to open it up to questions about uh, Merlin and eBird. Oops. So eBird is, is awesome. It's so cool. It's also a Cornell Lab of Ornithology product. It is, this is the citizen science and community science part of Merlin. It is a crowdsourced bird watchers effectively, it's moderated data. It is the world's world. So this is not just a North American thing. It is the world's largest biodiversity related citizen science project. So with eBird, you can make an eBird account. And your eBird account, you can use online 
on a browser or you can use the app. I really prefer the browser. <laughs> I really like the browser better than the app, um, but I'm, I'm trying to get better at using the app. Um, but people all over the world, especially very super big time birders, eBird is like their Bible. That's where they can keep their life list of all the birds they've seen. And this data has been used for a really long time. We're using this data now to, um, to track how climate change is affecting bird populations. And because it's such a large network and the data is moderated. So when you go and you submit something to eBird, someone who is a confirmed moderator, someone who knows what they're talking about, knows about birds, is gonna confirm or deny there, you know, if you put something weird in there, like I saw a penguin in Nevada, they're going to be like, mm, I don't think you did. And they're going to reject your finding. So um, the data is, is very reliable. I am going to go over this pretty quickly because um, eBird is more about logging what you're seeing rather than identifying. And so you can start a checklist. You would just press start and this pops up and this is location specific too so you do have to kind of download packs to make sure that you're in the right spot and you can click on the bird that you saw and so if you click on the cackling canada goose you can put in the number of birds that you saw um, there's also breeding codes that's something pretty specific but it also links to merlin bird id so if you see a bird and you aren't 100 percent sure you can double check it with Merlin Bird ID app too. And it'll go straight to those pages that we just saw. So that wood duck page where we were scrolling and comparing, it'll look like that. Um, and this is how you submit. I didn't put any species in, but one observer, how many minutes, and you can put just one bird in there if you want to, that's totally fine and then you confirm your location and that um, that kind of finishes that up. So um, on Merlin Bird ID, once you click, and actually what? Nope, the connection is that on Merlin Bird ID, once you confirm that you've seen, so if you click, yes, this is my bird on the Merlin Bird ID app, it prompts you to go and put it into eBird. So they haven't, they haven't fully made these two apps compatible where you could just like ID the bird and be like, add to my eBird list, um, but it is prompting you. So it's like, you can use the Merlin Bird ID app to make sure that your bird ID is good and then add it to your eBird list. Now that means you're using two different apps or you're using an app and then you're putting it on to a desktop computer, um, but eBird, is really great for birders. Also, if you like looking at birds, I prefer using the desktop version. And when I go on vacations, I will look up where we're going and I'll look up hotspots and I'll see what birds have been seen recently. And if it's an area that I'm not familiar with, then I'll look up all those birds and I'll listen to their calls so that I can potentially hear or see those birds while I'm there. So that's a good use for eBird because there's so, so much data there. Um, so that is the basics of Merlin Bird ID and eBird. So I'm going to open this up to, um, to the chat box. It looks like we have some questions coming in. Yeah, Julie, can you go over whether the apps function um, without cell service? So I believe that eBird does pretty sure it does. I don't think that Merlin Bird ID does though. I think you have to have that. But with, so say you're out somewhere and we're in Nevada, so cell service is not very, um, you know, not very reliable here. So you see something, if you can get a good enough picture of it, you can actually submit the picture to Merlin Bird ID after the fact. So when we were um, 
doing the photo ID, you can choose a photo and put a photo that you already have on your phone and put it in there. Or what I do sometimes when people send me pictures of stuff and I don't know what it is, I'll save their picture on my phone and then submit it onto something like this and ID it for them, which is really fun to do because then they think you're really smart. Any other questions about the Merlin Bird ID app and um, eBird? So Christine asks, what if you only hear it with the call info, can you ID? So that really depends on your, um, <laughs> your personal bird call knowledge. So I have been able to ID birds using the call info on there, but I heard the bird and I knew it was in I knew it was some sort of warbler. And so then I went into Merlin and looked at what warblers would be in this area in that bird pack. And then I just went in and listened to all the calls and compared it to what I was hearing. So hopefully one day there will be a function where you can just record it and it will identify it kind of like those music apps that you have where it hears the music and tells you what you're listening to. But otherwise, um, you really just have to go in and play the calls. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on. So the next app that we're gonna talk about is iNaturalist. And iNaturalist is, a, is one of my favorite um, apps, actually. It's super, super fun. And I saw someone else in the chat, I think it was Ann, she has a ton, she uses um, iNaturalist and has a ton of observations in there. So that's super, super cool that we've got people on here that love iNaturalist. So obviously Merlin Bird ID is very bird specific and we talked about using the photo function. I prefer to use just the bird ID where you just answer the five questions and that's because getting a good picture of a bird is really hard. And it's especially really difficult on a phone. So <clears throat> iNaturalist is really cool because it's for everything else. You can put bird photos in there, um, but it's for a lot of things that are a lot easier to get pictures of. And again, iNaturalist is different from Merlin because it has the citizen science function already right in it. So it's kind of like a mixture of eBird and Merlin because with our with um, iNaturalist you can also keep track of all of your observations and get some of that identification help. Um, so it's crowd force crowd sourcing crowdsourcing identifications. Um, there's a photo ID feature. Um, there's also a social network aspect. So if you and we're gonna I've got something cool that we can practice um, today. But if you get something and you're just like, I do not know what this is, you can get as close to the identification as you can and then submit it and people will go in and ask or they will correct you very politely. But they will suggest that, you know what, maybe it's not that, maybe it's this. And so there's a little bit of a, a social networking aspect to it. It also is a great learning tool. There's a lot of great information and it has a website. So, um, when I'm using iNaturalist to explore information, I prefer to use it on the desktop or on something larger than a phone, like a tablet. Like even at work, I'll do stuff on our work tablets um, to look at where different things are. So um, before we continue, iNaturalist is a joint effort between the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic Society. So when you log in to iNaturalist, this is your homepage. Um, you can see these are all of my observations. Um, I've got, I need to do better, but um, I've got a couple. And so you have a username just like any other social network. Um, and then these are all of your observations and what 
what day, how many days ago you did it. Um, and then on the side here, you can see those little comment boxes where it says like one, three, one, two, two. Those are all comments on those observations. And so at the bottom, we're gonna go from left to right what these different functions are. So there's an explore function, this activity function, the observe function, and then right here where we're at right now is the me, and that's really just your log. And you can see I have 71 observations. And then that more part. So we're gonna start at the explore tab, and um, it will zoom in where you are right now. This is not where I am. This is actually Oxbow Nature Study Area, which is one of our parks. It's at the end of Dickerson Road. It's right on the Truckee River in Reno. Very, very neat park, and people are very active on iNaturalist there. Um, I didn't wanna show you where I am because that's personal, but, um, all of these dots here, these are all observations. And the different colors say, tell you what the observation is of. So the green ones are plants, that makes sense. The blue ones are animals that aren't insects. And then the red ones are insects, or insects or arthropod spiders, those types of things. Um, and so if you click on those, which we're not gonna do just yet, um, if you click on those, it'll pull up the observation, and we'll do that in just a second. But this is the map view. You can also go to a grid view and see pictures. And so it says at the top, restricted to current map area. So where we were just zoomed in, that is showing only on that grid view what is in that area of that map. So if I zoomed out to the entire state of Nevada, what would pop up is observations from the entire state of Nevada. And then you can also do it like this, this list view. And so the list, you can see which observations are research grade and which aren't. And <clears throat> we'll go over how an observation becomes research grade, um, but that's pretty cool to see too. So on that map view, let's click on one of these. So I picked this red outlier right here, which I have a feeling like this is an observation made at someone's house. <clears throat> and they found something pretty cool. They found a Western black widow and you can see it was like somewhere on their house. <laughs> and so this is what the observations look like. You can see this person's username, the date that they put it in there. You can tell by these little dots that they've submitted two pictures that it's been ID'd and you can see that it's research grade. And um, if you click through, so, oops, hold on. If I click on this arrow right here, it will take me to the information page about the Western Black Widow. And there's more pictures there. It tells us the scientific name. There's a link to go to Wikipedia and you can learn even more about this species. And then, there's a map of where other people that are using iNaturalist have submitted observations of this species. So <clears throat> that is the explore tab. Now if we click over and we go down to this activity tab, this is basically like a notification for your, your profile. So these are all people that have made suggestions, um, they've maybe commented. I know one time I accidentally uh, submitted something that was cultivated and I got in trouble. So they were like, please take this down. <laughs> so don't submit cultivated plants. Someone will yell at you. They won't yell at you, but that's in order to maintain the integrity of the data, they don't want that stuff up there. So um, the other thing is, is that there's my content and then there's the news tab. And the news tab has some very cool things that are specific only to iNaturalist. I really hadn't clicked on this before. And now I see there's a bunch of cool articles that I need to come back and catch up on. Like they've, they now have iNaturalist in Israel. Or a plant was found hundreds of kilometers from its own range. Like th those are really cool things that we can read about and learn about what types of things people are seeing around the world. Like you can see an amateur naturalist in Greece posts, you can't see the rest of it, but um, different stuff like that. So if we go continue on, we're gonna go to this observe button. 
And so I submitted a picture of a cricket I found in my house. So you can kind of see this, but again, I'm going to go through this and then we're going to try it out with a picture again. Um, <clears throat> but I had a picture that I'd already taken. So just like the Merlin app, you can take a photo right now, or you can upload a photo that you, um, that you already have. And so I had an old photo here and this is kind of the magic of, of this app is this, what did you see suggestion box here? So I uploaded this awesome photo of a cricket of a, a Jerusalem cricket that I found in my house the other day. And, um, let's see if it can identify it. So it uses, um, technology on it's way beyond my head, but, um, to identify it. And so you can see it's got, we're pretty sure it's this. And this was actually able to get down to genus, which is pretty good. And then there's also some other suggestions. Now, remember, we already went over our identification basics. So we want to double check. So you can click this I with a circle around it, this information, and go to that Jerusalem Crickets uh, information page. And I can look and I, oh, okay. People are finding them here, so that means I can see them here. And you can compare it to the picture that you have, or if you still have the specimen in front of you, you can compare it to the actual thing. And then you can um, select it and submit it. And then hopefully people will, um, uh, uh, will agree with you, and then it can become research grade. So you submit it onto your page and, um, then it sinks and it sits there and maybe people will comment on it. Maybe they won't. Um, <clears throat> who knows? It depends. So the me tab. Oh, I skipped something. Sorry. Here we go. So the me tab is this tab right here. It's where you can see all your observations. And I wanted to click one so we can look at it and see what it see what it kind of looks like. And I randomly picked one and um, I didn't mean to pick this one, but I can tell by this date, this is a very special date and the location. Um, so this was a beetle that I found on the very top of Half Dome when I was there last year. And this was either right before or right after I got engaged. So it was a really, a really special moment. And you can eye naturalist anywhere, anytime. So I've got priorities. Um, but I found this really cool beetle on the top of Half Dome, and I have no idea what it was. I still don't have any idea what it is. Um, and you can see this is not research grade. And, um, oh, my fiance's on here. It's Jake. <laughs> So I still don't have any idea what this beetle is, but I submitted this and this is what popped up and I just put it on there and uh, we'll see what people said. So I thought it was a dusty surface beetle because that's what the app was telling me, but someone came in and they suggested this other ID and I don't think I've agreed to it yet. So it's not yet research grade, but that's where you can see some of these different um, interactions that are coming in, people telling you what they think it is. Um, and I've got another one to show you too, so you can see what it, it, that looks like. So this was, a, this was an observation of a moth I found in a parking lot, and I didn't know what it was. I put something in there and someone else suggested this, then someone else suggested it, and so I agreed with it. And now this observation is research grade. So that's the difference between research grade and not research grade, is that research grade has been moderated by not necessarily experts, but by enough people in the iNaturalist world. And so that's what's kind of cool about iNaturalist is you can go in there on two different sides. So if you just wanted to be on the app and just go through, say you're like an expert at ladybugs, you are an expert at identifying ladybugs. So you can just go through and sit there and suggest identifications for all of these ladybug um, observations. And then they can become research grade. And so you're helping people get better at identifying and that the way their system works, which like I said, is way above my head, but the way the system works is that the more pictures they can ID, 
the better the system gets at IDing. And if you use this, you'll find that like, I really like spiders, but spiders are really hard to identify to begin with because they're hard to get good pictures of because you need their, you need to see their eyes. Um, but spiders, the uh, software is not very good at identifying, but moths and butterflies, they are because people love moths and butterflies. So they, they submit a lot of those pictures. So you can be on two different ends. You can be a submitter or you can go in and you can do both of them. I do both. I'll go through and, and confirm and suggest IDs too. So the last part here uh, is this more and there's projects and guides. So projects are really cool that you can join a project and um, you can also create a project. You can do your own bio blitz. So for example, this WRSRA bio blitz, that was a bio blitz that we did with the Walker River State Recreation Area. And you can click on it. And so I've already joined it. You have to join the project first before you can submit something to it. And when we go through, um, well, actually I can show you. So when you go to submit an observation, you can add it to a project right here. So at the bottom, it's projects. You have to have joined the project first before you can um, submit to it. And iNaturalist is cool. You can submit things that don't have pictures, but they, they cannot be research grade unless you have a picture. And you can see, a lot of these that have been submitted to this bio blitz that don't have pictures are birds because they're hard to get pictures of. And so I clicked on one here, which our friend Patricia Tierney, I didn't realize that she made this, but um, we know who she is. So uh, she submitted a red-tailed hawk. She probably did see one, um, but it says this observation needs a photo to be considered for research grade. And it's totally okay to make submissions that are not research grade. Um, so there's different projects that you can join. It's location specific. So I'm here in Reno right now. And so the ones that are being pulled up are all the ones that are kind of near me. And um, I will say Oxbow, our park, um, Endows Park also has a project. So if you ever go there, you can submit to that project. And um, uh, Someone just asked if you can submit sound recordings. And as of right now, no, it's just photos, but that would be super cool, especially for frogs and toads and birds and all of these loud things that we have. Um, but you can join these projects, any of them, some of them are super cool. And then you can start contributing to those projects. And for example, you can start your own project. Like if I had my own really big yard, I would probably start my own project so then they're all in a nice easy place where you can separate them from your own observations. So it's nice to have a place to have all of those observations. So this is showing again where those projects were. I wasn't sure if I put a slide in here for that, but that's where you can put those projects. <clears throat> this is guides. So this is if you click on the guides. I have no guides. So if I said your guides, there's nothing in there for me. I have none. Um, and what I can tell, none of these guides are that local to myself. Like it's picking up stuff from the San Francisco area, but they are pretty cool. This is more of the exploration thing. So I clicked on this sage hens, parasitic and carnivorous plants and plant pathogens, because that sounds super neat. And this is what it looks like. It has all of these cool plants. <clears throat> and um, they, I clicked on the sundew here, and it just gives you more information. It has some nice pictures. They look really nice, um, but I, we don't have any guides around us. I don't know how to create a guide in here, but it looks like a cool thing that you can learn. Um, you can learn more about, um, about different things that are around you. So let's try this out. So I want you to open up the observe and I am going to put a poll up again. So I want you to go ahead and walk through those steps that we just did and take a picture of this flower. 
So if you click that observe button at the bottom, take a picture, click next, click on that what did you see, and a bunch of things are gonna pop up. This is a pretty common flower, so some people might already know what it is without, um, without needing the app, but So someone asks, how do you start your own project? Where on the app? So I think I have started projects before. Let's see, I'm in the project side of the app. I think you might have to do it on the, um, on the desktop version. Julie, I was just looking into that as well and it does look like it it's a kind of a desktop version um, thing that you have to do. Thanks, Jess, yeah. So if you go into the desktop version, um, you can create your own project. Yeah, no problem. So um, it looks like most people finished, and so we'll share those results. Most people got it right. It is a desert evening primrose, but it can be a little tricky with those yellow flowers. Um, and someone asked if this was a weed. No, evening primrose is not a weed. Uh, I guess that's, that's relative, but um, they are a beautiful, beautiful flower. Sorry, folks. All right, so we are gonna try this one more time because I wanted to use an example of, oh, thanks for posting that, Jess, that's awesome. So there's a, an easy, <laughs> an easy step-by-step -step guide and someone said definition of a weed is any plant out of place um so we're gonna do this again with a photo that I don't know what it is iNaturalist hasn't helped me yet but I wanted um to give an example of something where you still need to use some of our ID skills so I've got a picture here that one of my coworkers sent to me because she found this cool frog or toad in her backyard. And so um, let's see what iNaturalist, I wanna see what iNaturalist is telling you folks about. And then there's another little clue too. So let's go ahead and observe this, take your picture, see what iNaturalist is telling us. And if you wanna tell me in the chat what, some of the results are that you're getting. And then if you want to explore what some of those results are, oh, which you know what, okay, okay. There's some pretty glaring uh, uh, um, clues as to why some of these suggestions are definitely not right. And so if you click that information tab, you can see why and I want to see if anyone gets what some of those clues are so let me know what um what it's telling you so Anne's saying that the lake safe frog and we're going to talk a little bit about this particular animal's legs in just a second so let me know in the chat what iNaturalist is telling you they think this frog is someone's saying puddle frog Blanchard's cricket frog. We've got two people saying that. Those who said cricket frog, did you click on the information about um, Blanchard's cricket frog? And there might be some clues as to why it probably isn't a Blanchard's cricket frog. Exactly, it's not shown in our area. So a lot of the results that popped up are not found in this area or would be a little bit outside of this area. So there are a couple, oh good, Emily, thank you. So Sierra tree frog, Baja California tree frog, Blanchard's cricket frog. So we're getting a bunch of the, a, a bunch of different ones. Um, I got a bunch of ones that were very, like the Rio Grande chirping frog, a coastal tailed frog that do not live in this area at all. Um, so there's a couple clues here that 
Um, tell me that it's not a cricket frog, at least. And so we're going to zoom in. Um, oh, Marianne says she's not seeing any choices. Did you click on the what did you see and view suggestions? There we go. So we're gonna zoom in on this little guy and there's a couple clues here that clue me in that it's not, it wasn't some of the things that it was telling me. So these feet here are really distinctive. They have kind of like little round things on their toes is what I'm seeing, which you can tell me in the chat what frogs have little round things on their toes. And then it also has a really tiny nose. So using some of those ID marks are helpful. Now I'm still not 100% sure what this is, but using some of those clues makes me, yeah, makes me think that it's some sort of tree frog or a chorus frog. And so one of the ones that, that popped up was a seer and tree frog. So I actually submitted it um, just to see, because color remember color is one of the last things but there this is a very dark specimen and you can't tell in this picture the Sierra tree frog has like a really distinctive eye stripe but you can't see it in this picture and they do come in a couple different colors and some of them are darker but i'm not 100 sure yet so we'll see what the eye naturalist kingdom has to say about it so that's the gist of eye naturalist and it looks like you guys have pretty much mastered it. If you guys have any questions before we move on to our last, but certainly not least, Seek is super fun, um, our last app that I wanna show you and share with you. All right, doesn't look like there's any questions right now. So we'll move on to Seek. So Seek is by iNaturalist. It's an extension of iNaturalist. It's actually a tool that goes along with iNaturalist. And um, Seek is a lot more kid-friendly. It is very user-friendly. And you'll see when we use it that it has a really cool function that I don't want to tell you. I want you to see it for yourself. So when you log in, this is what it looks like on Seek. You can click anywhere. And then you'll see this right here. This is your homepage. You can see already, I think iNaturalist looks great, but you can see how much more user-friendly this is. <clears throat> and so if you go to that side panel, you can see you've got home, which was that homepage we were just at, achievements, challenges, observations, all of that. So this is what I think is really fun about Seek, and I clearly need to use Seek more um, but you can get these little achievements and badges, which are really fun. So I've only seen a couple things, but those are some of the badges. There's also challenges. There's a citizen science challenge that you can do right now. All of these different challenges, all sorts of fun stuff. And then there, there's your observations. So my observations, this part is sorted by group. So it's by plants, animals, insects, mammals, all of that. This is that iNaturalist, it just tells you a little bit more about that and you can link both of them so that you can submit to iNaturalist through Seek and you'll see why in just a second, why that's so cool. Um, this is just a little bit more about, there's a lot of big, big names associated with Seek and iNaturalist. And then this is the settings and then notifications if you click that little bell in the corner and I don't have any notifications. So um, on your homepage, <clears throat> you can click this right here and you can filter through what you're seeing nearby. And so you can filter through those different types of plants and animals, and then you can change your location too. So we are gonna go ahead and give this a go. It's a pretty simple, um, pretty simple app. And so if you go to your Seek app and you click on that camera, you can see this is what you'll see. It says, always be aware of your surroundings, um, all of that. So I'm gonna show you a picture on the next page. 
And I want you to go ahead and put your camera over it. Now this might be a little, yeah. And go ahead and take a picture. And if you wanna tell me what you're seeing on your camera in the chat. Feline, yeah. So Seek is really neat because it's immediate. You don't even have to take a picture and it will start to tell you what it is. Now, obviously we all know this is a mountain lion, um, but this is a good example because my, my, my camera or my computer screen is too bright, so I can't get a good photo quality. And so when you hover your camera over, you can see these green dots. And so the green dots slowly fill in. And so with each dot, it's getting closer and closer to species. So it's going from kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And so when I was taking a pic, trying to take a picture of that cat, I only got so far to felines. So I didn't get to genus species. I was only in the family. Now, obviously I, downloaded this picture so I know it's a mountain lion. Um, but you can see that you don't even have to take a picture and it's already starting to ID it. So for kids and students, this is a really, really cool tool to be able to use. Then you can take a picture. Oh, we're gonna test it out after this. Then you can take a picture and um, once you take the picture, then you can submit it to iNaturalist. So you can use Seek as this tool to get this instant gratification and get those cool badges and do these challenges and then still be contributing to the iNaturalist citizen community science um, community. So I've got one more challenge for everyone. And um, I'm gonna show you this picture it's a very common butterfly. And then we're gonna take a poll of what type of butterfly you think it is. And then I want you to ID it. So here's the picture of the butterfly. I'm gonna launch the poll in just a second. So go ahead and tell me what type of butterfly you think that is. And then once you voted in the poll, go ahead and use that Seek app to tell you what it is. Yeah, Marianne noticed. So I wanted to pick one that would absolutely ID. And it looks like a lot of you were not stumped, but some of you were. We had about half and half. Um, so this was indeed a Viceroy. And it is a good photo. It goes straight to Viceroy to ID it. And um, I d you can see it went all the way to species. It identified it as a viceroy. And you can tell, I'll give you guys a hint on how to tell the difference. Viceroys have this line on their bottom wing that goes through. Monarchs do not have that. Once you know this mark, it becomes really easy to tell the difference. Also in the wild, viceroys are just a little bit smaller. All right, good job guys. So <clears throat> that is the, that's the basics of Seek. And that was the last app that I wanted to show you. Um, I did wanna point out some other apps and websites that I really like. Um, I shouldn't say apps. Um, there's a website that I really like and then there's two apps that I know are highly recommended. I personally have never used them, but um, the Animal Diversity Web, that's a website. It has all sorts of animals on it from all over the world. It's run by the University of Michigan. I think they're their school of zoology or their lab of zoology. Um, and they also have a kids version of the same website called BioKids, a really, really great place to go. Um, the National Wildlife Federation, they have some apps in there. They're called like NWF My Nature Guides. Nope, that's the next one that I'm gonna talk about. Um, but they have some really cool apps. They have all sorts of different apps that you can use and they have tracking apps. So that's like 
iNaturalist and uh, eBird and Merlin, they won't do, they don't do tracks or anything like that. So um, these two, the National Wildlife Federation apps and the My Nature apps, they have track apps too. So you can submit apps and, or tracks and um, get some ide identification. So um, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you learned that we can use technology in our backyard to learn a little bit more um, and you feel more familiar with some of these apps. Uh, these are some of my favorite ones to use. I like to use them. Um, technology can be a really, really great tool to um, explore your backyard. And with that, uh, we do know that this is a really weird time, so we're trying to get information out there to make it easier and more fun for people to explore their backyards. There's a lot out there. Um, we know it's hard to stay home right now, so um, we do thank you all for staying home, and we hope that you continue to be safe um, and staying home for Nevada. And so at this time, if you have any questions, I will try and answer some of those in the chat. Um, if you have any other questions or if you're having problems with any of these apps, you can contact me um, through my email and I can help you with that too. Have you used Seek to identify the frog? Oh, that's a good question, Dolly. Um, <laughs> well, you for Seek, you have to have the thing elsewhere. So I guess I could try and do it on my computer, maybe. Yeah, Christine, I hope that you, um, I hope that you use these apps. It'll be fun. All right, folks, if you have any other questions, we're going to go ahead and shut the chat box down and end the webinar. Um, and if you have any questions or, or um, need help with, a, oh, that's a good question, Marianne. Uh, but if you have any other questions after this, please reach out to me at my email. It's up on the screen right now. Um, we do have more webinars. So um, the next one that's coming up, I don't have it up on our Facebook yet, but right after this, I'm going to put it up. This Sunday, we have a front yard fishing program. It'll be at, uh, well, you know what? I'm pretty sure it'll still be at 2 p.m. Um, but if you want to learn from one of our angler educators, she's going to be teaching us how to um, how to practice some of our, our fishing skills while we're at home. So that's coming up on Sunday. Then we have a coyote one on Monday. And I believe, let me check. Yes, we have a Reno's Backyard Birds on Tuesday. And we are filling in the schedule all the time. So please check out uh, our Facebook page. We will be updating these events as we get them up. So we're really looking forward to bringing you more programming while you're all at home so we can bring the wildlife to you. So thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and end the webinar now. Thank you so much.